All right, so Spellmonger, book 11, th Pharmaturge. I think that's how you pronounce it. So the main thrust of this vi so the main thrust of this book is basically starts off with Min being exiled and his efforts to then get his new rel realm in um, in his what it is being called the Mage Law. He he gained the the title of Count in the last book, which I have to say it's nice to see the that there are some characters who can be counts and not be considered evil. It's weird that that's like the one royal title that I've noticed that where there's almost no good counts and I have no idea why. I mean, the about the extent of it is uh, the vampire from Sesame Street and that's the only pop culture count I can think of that's not evil. Not a saint. The Count of Monte Cristo. Whatever. That was a pointless observation. But this starts in the town of Vanador, which we got glimpses of at the end of Pentandra's bo book on the series. She has, like, the plans all laid out for everything. For everything, and, you know, they're starting to build up the, the, the mage law from there. And it's mostly just a bunch of escaped slaves and people who have nowhere else to go. Um... So, that's difficult, but a lot of this ends up being sort of like a magic unleashed sort of thing. I feel like one of the underlying points here is that the, is that the majocracy as they knew it, they kind of went overboard and too much prominence to mages. They, uh, the mages became too prominent, they were expected to do more than one thing, one thing, whereas the, you know, the five duchies that preceded the preceded this had the problem of they tried to suppress mages too too much they tried to give the warriors too much of the too much of the political power whereas the different whereas the the current kingdom castle sire and particularly min's little area of castle sire or is just putting really competent people in charge regardless of their social station or if they were born with born with a um, as a mage or not. The Majocracy was a thesis, the Five Duchies was a counter thesis, and the uh, Castile Shire was the... You know, I forgot the right word to go there. <laughs> you know, there's a word for it specifically. I know there is, is that I'm looking for right here, but I can't remember it. Anyway, it's the balance between the two. two. I guess you could say it's the Goldilocks zone. <laughs> But with the need to, to, you know, set up an entire new system of government, basically, they need uh, the experience of uh, a new of uh, a new character in this book series. At least I don't remember him ever showing up before. Brother Bright the Wiser, who is the kind of, I think he says, I think he's called the Viceroy of the Mage Law. And he is just a uh, law brother who's dedicated to trying to find a a set of rules and regulations that will work for basically everyone. Keeping in mind, you know, certain privileges of the mage class, but also keep it, balancing that with certain duties that they must uphold. And this leads to several examinations throughout the book about the, the role that the law actually plays in society. It's not just like one ironclad thing that it's always applied. It's like... <sighs> Like, e even in this, Br Brother Bright says that there's going to be room for interpretation. I'm not going to cover everything, but you have to understand the spirit of the law. And, you know, you have to write that down for that to come about. And I, like, really enjoyed these conversations about the nature of the law. What What is it supposed to do and where it comes from and uh, why why it's generally a good thing to follow the law. One of the other things that kind of struck out to me throughout this entire book is uh, Alia and her condition. She's getting better, but it's very clear it's not the Alia we all knew from, from before Enchanter. But still, you can get a sense through Min's words about the simple joy he has about being married. But, you know, compared to, like, other fantasy series you might read, I enjoy the fact that Min, that Min is, like, married and has been for, like, most of the series because... A lot of the series will tend towards, you know, a lot of ins and outs and love interests and, you know, big showy, showy understandings of love. When a lot of the time, I think that it's better to just show, like, a couple in love. And that's, that's, that's just something enjoyable to watch. And 
just seeing a couple that love each other is an enjoyable thing to see in any sort of book or any sort of media, really. I don't know. That, that, that's just one thing that I, I, I noticed a lot more on on this. I feel like Min's apprentice, Ruderall, has got a lot more going on in this book than he has than he's been seen to in other books. He has the uh, basically talent of being able to see people's enneagrams. Basically, he sees their nervous system. If you need a down-to-earth understanding of what I mean. And that makes him um, really not naive about human nature in any sort of meaningful sense. He's somebody who can... He can't tell what you're thinking, but he can tell what you think about what you're thinking, if that makes any sense. So he offers like a kind of a interesting perspective on things basically being always being able to tell when somebody is lying or concealing the truth rather and you know he probably would know things about you that you don't know about yourself and it makes sense that somebody who grew up being able to tell when people are lying to them and everything would not would develop in you know a certain way and that's would develop a personality that's somewhat utilitarian I suppose you would say and since we're on the subject of Vanador and I haven't really talked too much about this subject before let's talk about the other races of the Kalidor particularly the ones that humans end up interacting with the most the Karshak the river folk and the tree folk which I mean these are all obviously um these are all obviously inspired by hobbits dwarves and elves from Lord of the Rings. I, you know, I see a weird amount of defensiveness about that kind of th thing amongst a lot of fandoms. I don't know why. But if I told a Warhammer fan that, yeah, it's basically Lord of the Rings, for whatever reason, they'll say that, like, no, 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 no. You see, the elves in this set, set his ears are about 3.5% longer than the elves in, in Lord of the Rings, which make it a completely different thing. See, they're McDonald's. I'm McDowell's. Huh? They got the golden arches. Minus the golden arcs. Okay, whatever. But I don't really see that a lot in the spell mo amongst a lot of the amongst the people who I've talked to in the spellmonger fandom. It mostly seems to be the understanding that yeah, these are elves, dwar dwarves, and hobbits, and we all just sort of accept that. I don't know. I just like that a lot of people seem so unpretentious about this. Yeah, we know. Let's tell the story now. But to that end, this uh universe's version of dwarves are called the Karshak, or at least that's what one of the clans are called. I can't quite recall because there are seven clans because they're dwarves. There's always going to be seven of them. It doesn't matter what's going on. There's going to be seven something dwarves, but they're very clearly meant to be like the kind of craftsman like people, but they are also shown to have kind of a rigid hierarchy where they don't like straying outside of like um, established protocol. If humans need a window, uh, they don't care about how their grandfather did it. It's just important to have a window. Whereas the Karshak tend to be very tradition-focused and such, which somewhat limits their ability to uh, innovate, really. Moving on, we have the Alkalon, which are very obviously the elf, an the elf analog of some description. I, I think they're literally referred to as elves in certain... Um, like, humans will refer to like something associated with the Alkalon as like the elf's gap or something like that. that. So these words are used, literally. And one of the things I've noticed about the Alkalon in this series is they came, is that they seem to be incredibly, for lack of a better word, immature. I suppose some of that has to do with the fact that we're dealing with a lot of them that are relatively young compared to their compared to their elders. Like uh, I think like a few hundred years is still considered barely above an adult, and we all know like 19, 20 year olds who've made incredibly stupid decisions. Do the right thing. Sign here and you'll be an English major. I was like, oh, okay. But some of that feels like it probably it might actually come from the fact that, um, okay, so in biology, there's a term that gets thrown around sometimes. It's called nadastic. It refers to traits that are common amongst the children, common amongst children that continue on into adulthood. Wolf puppies have what we would consider 
or have what we consider larger eyes. Uh, they have floppier ears. They play a lot. But wolves don't. Whereas dog puppies, a lot of the same traits of kind of having floppier ears in general, you know, playing when they're older, uh, larger eyes, that's all something that's kept from childhood, from puppy to dog. That's what, like, an nadastic trait is. Um, for the record, humans actually are quite nadastic compared to other animals. We carry a lot of traits from childhood into into adulthood. Um, you know, just the tendency for people to play in any sort of meaningful sense as they get older. That's an example of um, a certain trait. Our eyes tend to be a bit bigger, bigger compared to what they would necessarily be. Uh, tend to be less hairy than other apes. But the Alka Alon seem very much like they fall like a high degree of that. They seem to carry a lot of traits from from their their version of infancy to their version of adulthood, which kind of like makes me think about which kind of just makes me think about how they're so kind of immature about things so frequently. If I were to put this in D and D terms, I would say they have a negative one to wisdom rules, if that makes any sense. Whereas humans tend to grow up a bit more, a bit more in the same amount of time, and they tend to like have less of a uh, kind of a selfish, childish attitude about about things. I mean, not all of them, clearly. And this is all talking like in general, but I just. I don't know. I found that a, I found that a lot of the the alcoholon, while being kind of the elf analog, also have just this incredible immaturity about them that that you don't really see until you start seeing it all over the place. And the final race that you would say is kind of on our side is the river folk or the talalon. These guys are a lot like their hobbit counterparts in that they are really, really hard to dislike. Uh, some people treat them kind of as, you know, some lords and such kind of treat them kind of as pests. But they're generally a very free-loving folk who spend a lot of time around humans, seemingly because the Alcalan want nothing to do with them. And the Gavani might want something to do with them, but not in a way that's conducive to their health. So they seem to spend a lot of time around humans simply because it's better to be a second-class citizen than be dinner. The final race that you could say is on our side is that of the humans. Yes. And I, um... Normally, I would sarcastically say that this is a fantasy race, but uh, I don't know if Terry Mancor has any uh, formal under or formal training in like the field of social biology or evolutionary psychology. But if he doesn't, he has a really good intuitive understanding of these uh, subjects because these have to be the first humans I've read in a fantasy book from recent memory that actually feel like they're humans, warts and all. There seems to be two major ways you can tend to take humanity in, in fantasy settings. You're either like something like The Witcher where you make people out to be far, far worse than they probably ever actually are. Or you take it in the way that Brendan Sanderson likes to ta take it in a lot of his books. Note, I do like Brendan Sanderson, despite all the shit I've given him on this channel. Where the parts that people don't like about human nature are kind of sacrificed on the altar of, It's culture! Uh, okay. I made a video about, like, the how the safe hand doesn't make a lot of sense, and that's basically what I'm talking about here. A lot, if there are any differences between men and women in a lot of Brendan Sanderson's books, it tends to be because culture. When, in actuality, all the evidence says, all the evidence says that we would expect there to be differences between men and women, regardless of complete equality. That just has a tendency of making me feel like a lot of Brendan Sanderson's world building is artificial. I don't think Terry Mancor has that problem. All the cultural differences between the sexes in this book seem like they stem from an actual biological understanding of the differences between men and women. And as such, I think, and as such, the series has humans that will generally do the right thing as long as you don't give them an incredible incentive to do the wrong thing. And I find that kind of refreshing because a lot of authors, especially in the grim and gritty sphere of things, tend to create, tend to make humans to be people who will cut off their nose to spite their face in massive numbers. I, you know, I imagine some people will do that, but most people won't go against their own best interests that much. I don't know. If I was going to boil down what I'm trying to say here, it's that the humans in Spellmonger, in the Spellmonger books, are actually Homo sapien. 
the humans in a lot of other fantasy books I've read recently are Homo sapien progressivalis. Humans, but if progressives were actually correct about human nature. Well, that was kind of a weighty subject ma matter. Uh, why doesn't everyone try and speculate on my political op my political opinion, given that observation? Unless you're my brother, you're probably wrong. Okay, so with my bit of indulgence where you listen to my own random political opi opinions while I try and force them on you and you kind of roll your eyes and say, how could this guy be this stupid? <laughs> stupid, done. Let's get back to talking about this book. I like that men's kids are actually starting to gain something approaching a personality. One of the major problems you always have in a lot of fantasy series is they, they'll they'll show up with like a, somebody like the guy and the gal will get together and the and then they'll have a baby and you're supposed to really care about the child but really the child doesn't have any personality yet so you don't really care the advantage I'm finding in this series that it's spend it's spanning like it's been like 10 years already already I think is that the kids are actually starting to gain something approaching a personality. And that will give, and that gets you to care about them. I imagine that they're going to become larger, care, more important characters as the series goes on, and they start. Uh, well, I, I'd be re at least some of them probably have to develop Regira, so I assume that's going to hap happen. I will happen at some point. And you're going to need to give up. And it's good that they're getting some personality before we're just sort of told that they're important now. Though this just sprang to mind while I was thinking about this. The unique circumstances of the Venadori is not dissimilar to the... Uh, I don't know if you've ever read about how England got out of the Dark Ages, but some people like to credit the, fa the, the Black Death as being at least in part... Uh, having some part of that... Basically, the idea being that if people are more rare, their work has more value. Uh, so the idea, of, so the idea is that um, people would uh, that under the old feudal system, um, you worked for your lord, and that was basically about it. But with this new, but after the black, but after the black death came through, through people had more inherent value. So they had to, so they could go over to a different lord's castle, and they'd have to pay that pay them so you know your time is start to wor be worth more people will start to be worth more you get you get the idea i feel like something similar is going on here in the like in Valador. the wilderlands are somewhat sparse and then they had the goblin invasion which killed a lot of them which are starting to lead to more capitalistic elements in this series I mean, side note about this, I do in fact think capitalism is a good thing, and I one time read somebody's explanation for how they would want social, uh, so their socialist utopia to work, and it was pretty much feudalism, but they didn't want a king. I don't know, I just thought that was amusing. <laughs> so yeah, the big military threat for the next three books, I presume, are going to be the, uh, these three Nimavort who are going to be attacking the Mage Law. And it's kind of set up very obviously as three bosses. And, uh, I mean, it's even so subtly implied easy, medium, hard, basically. With the first, with the first guy being Jadak Gatar. Jadak Gatar, I think that's how you pronounce it. Who's implied to be kind of a berserker without, for lack of a better term. He's, uh, somebody who hopes to overwhelm with, uh, decisiveness and, uh, quick, and quick action, but he's basically he's basically implied to be incompetent. And throughout the entire uh, book, I basically had the feeling like, yeah, this guy's gonna come and he's gonna kind of die, and it's not gonna be that big of a deal, and I, nothing major is gonna go wrong. Wrong, and, you know. Without me to spoil much, that's basically what happens. It's kind of a surprise. As it's put in the book, it's a surprise that there's no surprise here. Jada Qatar is kind of an incompetent commander and a good first foe to, you know, sort of test things on. That's not to say he doesn't pose he doesn't pose a threat and that the action scenes and all, and all that aren't exciting and everything, but it's like I always have this sense that I know how with this how things are going to go. They basically go as planned. I mean, to that end, you do see some of the plans for the next book, or maybe the next few, two, I'm not certain, being laid down with uh, Min's consistently antagonizing another powerful count. I think it's like uh, Gilmora, one of the Gilmoran counts. Um, he's consistently antagonizing him through several 
several ways, and I think it's pretty obvious them from the way that he's doing this is that he wants the guy to start invading right as one of the other like uh, goblin hordes start invading as well. Shit, you know, I just realized back to my uh, original point about the Alka Lawn being somewhat childish. The Nemovorti are basically edge lords. <laughs> Sorry, random thought. <laughs> But it, it's sort of implied that he's poking the bear to try and get them to attack so he can get a li So, you know, there are human troops in the area and, well, the goblins don't give a shit. So, to that end, I find a lot of these politic these political discussions are just as entertaining as the actual battles that are could take place. You know, like, the, the political maneuvering is kind of, you know, that entertaining at times. But, okay, so here's one other thing I should probably mention is that at the end of the last book there was a... Uh, piece of Tekka that started talking to Min, and we discover that his name is Forsetti. Uh, there aren't a lot of scenes with him in this book, but there are a few, and his main goal, his main job seems to be giving exposition about, about human, um, about the, about human history from a relatively unbiased viewpoint. Velastian does some of that, but she also very clearly has, like, a, um, she's very obviously, uh, what what would you what's the term a xeno a xenophile a xenophile she's someone who really loves alien cultures and things that are different from her own so sometimes i you know so her perspective is sometimes you know slightly skewed in certain ways but i do like that the exposition can be delivered in such a way that you can understand that it's not just exposition, it's the way the characters are communicating as well. Forsetti gives off a very, these are the, these are the facts kind of thing, kind of like aura to him, but, you know, you know how much can you really trust a computer? <laughs> but still, this was like some of my favorite scenes was just to le sit there and, l and listen to Min talk to a, what is essentially a, a souped up Alexa. Because learning about the history of the world is interesting if the author can make it interesting. I think a lot of authors need to th take that note. You gotta make your exposition an interesting to listen to. Uh, one final note I kind of want to make is that uh, this was the book that really stopped me. Uh, like I may have had an initial criticism that I had a hard time remembering some of the names. But this is the, this is the book where basically I got a very good idea of the name. Names. The names sort of suck with me a bit more throughout this book. So I think that's something that Terry Mancor Im improved with over time, obviously. He got me to understand that Telemann is the kind of guy that looks over at the Quaker Oats and goes, I know what you're planning. And, you know, Sandoval is the kind of guy who will always assume the worst. To that end, it's 11 books in. If you don't like it at this point, what else can I say? Whatever it is, I'm willing to put wave after wave of men at your disposal. Right, men? You suck!